Good day, everyone, and welcome to Create Climate Sanctuary for Backyard Wildlife with Kevin Monroe. This is the 13th of 18 programs in SSU's Dig Into Nature Fall 2021 series. My name is Margot Rollins, and I'm a program coordinator with SSU's Center for Environmental Inquiry. I'll be your host today, so you can let me know if you need anything. Our public events are usually done at our preserves, but we've gone virtual since the start of the pandemic and are slowly easing back into a hybrid model with all of our elements um, virtual except for hikes and training sessions in person at Osborne Preserve. If everyone could take a minute to type their name into the chat, that would be great. And that is our um, sign-in sheet for today. Our presenter is Kevin Monroe former CEO of the Laguna de Santa Rosa Foundation right near here in Sonoma County, and now Long Island, New York, Preserve Director for the Nature Conservancy. Kevin has created and delivered several events for CEI, from Insects After Dark to programs on dragonflies, and next season we're planning one on keystone species. Well, before we begin, I would like to tell you just a little bit about the center. We are here to empower students of all ages to, and disciplines to solve the environmental challenges of the North Bay, basically to turn education into action. We provide direct outdoor learning experiences on our three preserves. We have Fairfield Osborne on Sonoma Mountain in Runner Park, the Galbraith Wildlands Preserve in Southern Mendocino County and Los Quilicos in Kenwood. We provide classes, workshops, and tours that focus on experiential learning and skill building. Additionally, we make the preserves open to anyone. I mean, that is any of you, if you are interested in education research or creative inquiry. We invest in real world projects, working with faculty, community, and students across all disciplines again, to develop projects focused on finding solutions to North Bay environmental challenges. And finally, we create long-term multi-organizational partnerships that generate the resources and funding needed to chip away at these issues surrounding water, fire, technology, and other topics. What we, and I'm gonna ask Carrie if she would, yeah, there you go. Thanks, Carrie, the webpage where you can find more information on, on these uh, activities. But what we do at the center is to mobilize faculty, students, and community to solve complex environmental challenges. And we invite you to join our diverse community of learners and problem solvers, no matter your background or your connection to the university, because it takes all sectors of society and all parts of our community to be involved if we're gonna any, have any successful headway here. There are many ways to get involved. You can engage in research, take our naturalist or land, man, land management training programs, yeah. Learn about the virtual field collaboration for undergraduate classes, engage in internships and student jobs, access data, lead events, partner with us on projects, or help us create more programs like this by donating, since these programs are funded completely by the generous support of donors. And do come to our Saturday hikes on the Osborne Preserve. We're planning now to return to walks on the Galbraith Preserve in the spring. But today, under Kevin's leadership, we're gonna focus on things you can do in your own backyard for wildlife to provide shelter and sanctuary so desperately needed as we experience increasingly hot summer weather and prolonged drought in California. Kevin will present the background issues our wildlife are facing and then let us all get down to creating our own sanctuaries using some of the materials on the list I sent out to you guys, to all of you last week and again this morning. If you have clarifying questions as we go along, please put them in the chat. I will monitor that on Kevin's behalf. You are all muted and your videos are turned off um, in order to save, save bandwidth. But you're welcome to turn on if you need to have some interaction in addition to the chat. We've scheduled time for question and answers at the end of the hour and Kevin and I will stay on Zoom for a while afterward if you have more questions and ideas you wanna discuss. So here we are, Kevin, take it away. Thank you, Margo. It's great to be here. I've really enjoyed 
the work that I've done at SSU and CI. It's so much fun to work with Margot and Carrie and all the rest of the, the gang there. I miss all the folks in California. And so this is always a nice opportunity for me to see California faces again. Um, quick little bit about sort of the experience I'm trying to bring to today's program. Um, I've been lucky to work for organizations like the Nature Conservancy and Laguna Foundation, where I helped take care of sort of multiple properties that were several thousand acres of wildland, sort of on that large scale. And then I also, um, a couple of years ago, worked for National Audubon Society and focused on helping people in their backyard. So I was touring around Washington, D.C. and Northern Virginia and helping people with their small suburban backyards um, as far as adding wildlife habitat. And then I've worked for county and town park systems where I've dealt with parcels that were, you know, a couple hundred acres. So I'm trying to kind of bring all of that, the big and small, to today um, where we're going to have a fun time talking about backyard wildlife, which is really one of my most favorite topics. Another quick thing to add before I um, go to full screen here, this, you know, as, as Margo said, this is being recorded. So if you feel like we go a little fast through some things, you know, don't feel you have to kind of memorize everything or take notes. You'll be able to go back and look at the recorded program, fast forward, rewind, pause. Maybe there's just like six slides you really want to look at again, you'll be able to do that. And I've also listed three other programs here on this slide, creating shelter for wildlife, winged migration and climate change and making our lands resilient that I also did with Margot and Carrie for CEI. They're all recorded and are on their website. And each of them is a deeper dive on certain aspects of today's program. So you can go back and look at them too, if you're really especially interested in migration or um, climate change. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and get us started here. Let's see if I can go to full screen. Okay. Excellent, and it's advancing, good. <laughs> so, um, yeah, what I wanted to start with here, oh gosh, I'm sorry, it keeps having this problem with advancing. There we go, okay. So I wanted to start by just sort of pointing out why um, backyard habitat is so important right now. You know, cities are basically built out at this point. A lot of our rural landscapes are shrinking. There's wonderful wildlife habitat that can be done in both of those types of landscapes, but it's suburban landscapes that are really expanding and getting bigger all the time through urban sprawl. So backyard wildlife habitat is becoming more and more important every year because there's more backyards. And making that sort of commitment and that exciting decision to attract wildlife to your backyard doesn't have to be a scary thing. This change from the before and after picture here um, shows a huge difference that you could make in your backyard just over a couple of years. The folks that did this, I know them well, it's um, Carolyn J. Hadlock from Northern Virginia. They went into this knowing nothing about backyard habitat. They're not experts, they're not scientists. Um, they just did a little bit of research and in a couple of years were able to go from that before to after shot. So there's so much that you can do in your yards just as novices. So why are we talking about climate change today? Well, there's quite a few ways that climate change is having a detrimental effect on a lot of the wildlife that we see in our neighborhoods. Um, I did a whole presentation just on migration and climate change. I was going to touch on that here. Basically, what's happening as, is that as birds and butterflies and dragonflies and bats and whales and all these animals are migrating, they depend on certain food sources and the habitats that they visit during their migration being in a certain state when they get there. When they get to a certain habitat the second week of March or the third week of August, they are expecting particular food sources that they have gotten used to over thousands of years of migrating through there. Climate change is changing that so that butterflies are showing up and the milkweed has already passed bloom. Or whales are showing up to a part of the ocean and the krill they're supposed to 
um, feed on is not there because the oceans are warmer. So migrating wildlife is being disconnected from their food sources as they move around the planet because of changing temperatures and changing weather. And many of these animals are moving through your yard. So climate change is affecting migrating wildlife. A quick example, I'm sure you all know, migrating monarchs. Um, they're having a hard time because of the timing of when milkweed blooms, like I mentioned. Drought is removing a lot of their food sources. Extreme weather and heat happening during their migration. You can see it's had this incredible reduction in their population from that, that graph. There are birds all over the world, migrating birds especially, where climate change is reducing their numbers. There's this wonderful website that National Audubon Society does that I'll share at the end, where you put in your zip code and it will tell you exactly which bird species in your neighborhood, and that zip code, are climate threatened. And it's because their food source is threatened by climate change or the habitat that they especially need or um, particular weather events that are affecting them. So you can just put your zip code in and it will show you which birds in your neighborhood especially need help because of climate change. So other climate threatened wildlife to, to touch on, animals that depend on temperature regulation, because of course then extreme heat makes a big difference to them. For example, bats that hibernate in caves. The bat in the upper left-hand corner is a Mexican free-tailed bat. They depend on caves, as many bats do. If the temperature during winter goes up too high and they leave their caves because they're warm, they can then starve because there aren't enough insects. The other bat here is a hoary bat. That's a tree bat. They nest in tree cavities, not caves, but high temperatures during the winter can affect, adversely affect them too. These are both bats that can fly through your neighborhoods in Northern California. If animals are connected to temperature sensitive food sources, that can adversely affect them like bees that need flowers to bloom at a certain time of year. If climate change changes that, then that can have a drastic effect on bumblebee populations, which it is. There's also temperature sensitive habitats that are affected by climate change, like wetlands dry, drying up because there's not enough rain and it's too hot. Frogs, like this beautiful little Sierran tree frog, might see his habitat shrink because of climate change. So these are various ways that um, specific animals are especially vulnerable to climate change. So this kind of sums up what we just talked about. Now, first of all, all animals are vulnerable to climate change, right? Any animal you're helping in your backyard, you're doing a wonderful thing. But I wanted to talk about sort of which animals and animal groups are specifically threatened by climate change. Again, any animal you help in your yard, that's wonderful. Um, these are some that are especially vulnerable. Um, animals that have life cycles that are, that especially take place in late summer or fall, because that's when things are hottest. Animals that depend on temperature regulation, you know, mammals can regulate their own temperature, but insects, herps, which is reptiles and amphibians, um, and then bats being very temperature sensitive in the winter, and then temperature sensitive wet, um, habitats, as we talked about. Again, wetlands and mountains are especially sensitive to climate change. And I've listed some animals there, some examples that we just talked about. So what do they need to survive climate change in our yards? First, the difference between mitigation and adaptation, you might hear people talk about climate mitigation and climate adaptation. Climate mitigation simply means doing things to try to reduce climate change, to slow it down, to stop it, like using solar and water um, and wind power, hybrid cars. We're not talking about that today. We're talking about climate adaptation, which is what can we do in our yards to help wildlife adapt to climate change. There have been various, stu various studies that have come out recently that have shown that even if we did everything possible today to stop climate change, if we totally stopped using fossil fuels, did everything recommended, we'd still have at least 30 years of climate change problems, at least 30 years of high temperatures and raising sea levels. What that means is whatever's happening in the policy world, in the political world, in the industry world with climate change, we need to spend at least 30 years helping wildlife adapt to the climate change that's here. 
The main things you can do to help them are provide shade and cool shelter and water and moisture. It's shade and cool shelter, water and moisture. And then I've listed some of the specific ways that can play out in your yard. We're gonna go over each of those. We're not gonna talk about that last one today, the soil layers, that's a whole other presentation, but I did just wanted to mention that healthy, living, deep soil layers with lots of organic material, sequesters carbon and holds moisture. So healthy soil is a huge way that you can help with climate change on every level. So why is this especially important in California? Well, California is the highest level of biodiversity in the country and the highest level of endemism, which basically means there are more species only found in California than any other state. And this is because of the incredible breadth of and depth of diversity of habitat in California and all the resulting native plant nurseries. So you all as California residents can play a huge part in helping wildlife adapt to climate change. So we're gonna do just sort of like 101 basics on attracting wildlife as we also talk about the climate change part and the climate sanctuary part. I'm just gonna point out sort of the three things I have arrows with here for attracting wildlife. Diversity attracts diversity. So have plants in your yard that bloom and leaf in a diversity of seasons, that have a diversity of layers, tall and short, different kinds of structures. Diversity of habitat attracts diversity of wildlife. Be open to adapting and tolerating. Whatever you do in your yard, animals are going to use it in a way that you're not expecting. They don't read the books about what they're supposed to do. So you have to be open to adapting and tolerating which happens each year. It's gonna be different and it's never gonna be quite what you expect. The last thing is really try to fit your property. It may be that only 10% of the things we talk about here today really work in your yard and that's fine. If you do 10% of what we talk about, that's great. You want it to fit your yard, whether you have an apartment balcony or a hundred acres behind your house, you can do things in either of those and everything in between. I always like to talk about insect gardening because it's sort of a forgotten layer. What is that newt and toad looking at? Insects that they're about to eat. What is that bird feeding its baby? An insect. What is that bat dreaming about? Insects. <laughs> Insects are such an important layer for any sort of habitat, including your backyard. These are a list of some of the beneficial insects and other arthropods that can be in your yard. All insects, of course, are beneficial to the ecosystem, every one of them but at least 85% of them have been shown in several studies to be specifically beneficial in a human yard as far as helping gardeners in their yard, at least 85%. So we want these critters in our yard. We know the caterpillars turn into butterflies and moths and we love them for that alone. But in addition, moth caterpillars especially are the single most important food source for songbirds. Even hummingbirds, nectar specialists, feed caterpillars to their babies. Crossbills, grosbeaks, goldfinches that are seed specialists, they feed caterpillars to their babies. Cedar waxwings are fruit specialists as adults. They feed caterpillars to their babies. It's an easy, harmless source of protein. So having moth caterpillars in your yard may be the best way you can help birds. Native bees, of course, are so important. They're wonderful pollinators. They're better at pollinating because they're hairy and they hold more pollen and they buzz more. They do something called buzz pollination. Blueberries and tomatoes can only be pollinated by bumblebees, not honeybees, because bumblebees do this special vibration that those flowers need. There's a great article, a website here that we can send out later. Native bees are just so important in your yard. Dragonflies, what do dragonflies do? They eat mosquitoes and gnats all day, right? So they're literally protecting us from West Nile virus. They're just wonderful to have around, really important predators to have in your landscape. Assassin bugs, called that because they assassinate other insects. So here's one eating a Japanese beetle. 
Godspeed, more power to them if they're able to eat Japanese beetles. So we want predator insects in our yard. These are ichneumon wasps, parasitic wasps that inject beetle grubs straight through tree bark with these bizarre ovipositors they have. So we want them. They're gonna reduce the amount of beetle grubs in our trees. So they help keep the entire forest healthy. You want ichneumon parasitic wasps in your yard. These little tiny flower flies that most people don't even notice, not only are they good pollinators, their larvae, pictured here, eat aphids. So you want these little flies in your yard, their larvae are eating aphids that can be a pest if their population gets too high. And then of course we want the cleanup crew. Carrion beetles, dung beetles, rove beetles, they're soil farmers. They make our soil healthy by processing um, dung and carrion dead animals. Um, we would not have healthy soil without all these soil engineers, these beetles. So some basic tips on using native plants. There's so many ways to look at this here, three really basic ones. Cluster your native plants in your landscape. That's going to attract more wildlife and it's gonna mean less maintenance and weeding as well. You want native plants for all seasons. Think about all four seasons. You want layers, different heights. You want different types of shelter from the ground up. Here's just pictures of layers with depth and dense shelter. Go vertical, even if you have a narrow space, you know, plant up. Fruits for different times of years, you know, want fruits that are out in the summer, fall, winter. Here's a bluebird eating a summer fruit, but then in the winter, it needs a winter fruit, it needs hawthorn. So you want fruits at different times of year, because of course animals have to eat all year. Here are birds eating elderberries to give them a sugar high so they have enough energy to feed their babies in the summer. But then in the fall, when they're migrating thousands of miles, they need a totally different kind of food. These are dogwoods that have very fatty berries that give them energy to fly across continents during fall migration. Use the space that you have. Maybe it's a six foot wide concrete slab behind your house. Use hanging gardens, use a ladder to make a vertical garden. The two pictures on the right are of balconies. You can be in an apartment balcony and do container gardens that include shrubs and vines and native berries. You can have all sorts of wildflowers in a hanging window garden. Use the space you have. Some quick tips about a pocket meadow, which is sort of a specific type of native plant wildlife habitat. Again, April through October, try to have wildflowers that are blooming most of the year. Diversity attracts diversity. So have flowers of different colors and heights and seasons. I have a list here, some really good plant groups, but the best thing is to ask your local native plant society. Just do a Google search of plant society in whatever county you live in. And almost everywhere in the country, there's a native plant society with a website that will tell you what plants are best for where you live. Don't forget to include grasses and sedges in there with the wildflowers. That's really important. Lots of birds eat the seeds of those grasses and sedges. This will bring you goldfinches, lazuli buntings, hummingbirds, sparrows. Lazuli bunting, such a beautiful bird right there in Northern California that'll come to your pocket meadow. Butterflies, of course, including monarchs, which we've talked about being in trouble, they'll use your pocket meadow. Native bees, the little um, flies, tiger beetles, they'll come to your pocket meadow. Spiders, thousands of spiders, which are insect control, helps keep the balance. So you want the spiders in there as well. And we wanna be sure we're being fire aware and drought conscious. This is Northern California we're talking about, right? So we wanna make sure that we're thinking about summer and fall fires, and maybe you have to reduce your amount of water. So plant your pocket garden in a low area, in a ditch where there's already water and you do less watering and it's less flammable. Or do container gardens where you can move them around throughout the year. You can make sure using drought tolerant plants. You can use annuals that you don't have to water all year. This gives you flexibility. And maybe you can reduce the amount of container plants that you have during fire season or drought season. It's more flexibility. Some beautiful container gardens you can make. You can add water to them so it's a little water environment. 
Again, this is to help you be drought conscious and fire aware. Make your little gardens portable. Put them in a metal wheelbarrow, which isn't flammable. You can then move this around throughout the year so you can adapt it to the weather, get it closer to your hose in the fall. Um, so this makes your pocket meadows mobile. So a brush shelter, a brush shelter, sort of wood and rock shelter is also a really good wildlife habitat for your yard. You can have one that fits your site. These are some pictures that give you an idea of what it might look like. Because we're talking about California and we have to worry about fire, I would step back from the brush and instead focus on using um, rocks and sort of old rotten logs that are less flammable, tires, bricks, like these upper pictures here next to the red arrow, that's gonna make your wildlife brush shelter sort of fire wise. These are some of the animals that'll come to it. Spotted towhees, California quail, many, many other birds will use your brush and rock shelter, including all these amazing herps, newts, snakes, salamanders, toads, they'll come to your, your brush and rock shelter. And here's some ways to, again, really make it fire-wise. We don't want you to have big brush shelters in your Northern California yards during fire season. Here's people that have put their logs under sod. That's gonna attract a lot of the same animals, but it's not gonna be flammable. You can see rocks in sort of a soil mound here with the orange arrow, there's a pipe there. A lot of these animals can hide there, that's not gonna be flammable. You can see these other pictures, these are wildlife shelters where you don't have to worry about it being flammable, flammable. My new life goal is to have frog pipe gardens in every state. <laughs> I just found these pictures a couple of days ago. This is so cool. Here's a way to sort of add um, wildlife shelter and cooling dens for these critters. Take a PVC pipe and bungee cord it to the side of a tree. You'll have tree frogs in it. Stick those pipes in your garden, tree frogs. Stick, stick these pipes, just one or two in an outdoor potted plant. They'll have tree frogs in there. It's a great way to help them through hot summers and you can't get cuter than this. Wildlife snags are another good way to provide habitat for wildlife. And if, if you have a de dead tree that's tall, you're afraid of it falling on your house, just cut it to 20 feet or even 10 feet, even a short 10 foot snag can provide habitat for wildlife, then it's safe and you're not worried about it falling. Flying squirrels, tree frogs, owls, swifts, bats, wrens, woodpeckers, butterflies, all of these critters will be in holes in a standing dead tree, even a 10 foot standing dead tree. Maybe you don't have any snags, that's fine. You can install bat houses, which is what all these pictures are, except the frog garden, which I'm gonna put in like every slide now. But you can also put up bird boxes or flying squirrel houses. Even if you don't have any old dead trees, you can put up these boxes that provide similar habitat. So how about creating a water feature, a wildlife pool? Many ways to do this. I like to call it a pool instead of a pond because you want something shallow, just a foot or two deep, gradual slope. Think of a box turtle being able to get in and out of there. You want vegetation, you want structure for wildlife. It's better if it's fishless because the fish will eat the salamander and frog larva and dragonfly larva. Here's some pictures. This is kind of what I'm thinking about. It's shallow, gradual slope, lots of vegetation, more of a pool than a pond. These are some of the critters that you can see in it. Most of these are either in California or there are California versions of these. There are a lot of birds that will not come to your feeders because maybe they don't like seed, but they will come to this water feature, warblers, tanagers, robins. If you want detailed step-by-step -step help on how to make a wildlife pool, these are two great websites, which we will send to you that will tell you step-by-step -step with pictures and everything, exactly how to make a wildlife pool. I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail on that because that's kind of a whole other presentation but these websites will help you step by step. So California drought, you don't wanna be sticking a hose, keeping your pond full all summer. If, if Governor Newsom is sending us all much needed um, notifications, we need to reduce our water use because of drought. 
Well, no problem, because most wildlife that are using these pools for breeding only need it February through June. Just remember dry in July. By July, it's okay to let your pool go dry. And that's usually when we're supposed to start regulating our water use. So February through June is when these salamanders, frogs, dragonflies are breeding. So I'm gonna show you some pictures again of sort of what we're talking about. This is the largest type of wildlife pool that I'm thinking of. This is still relatively small. It's like six by six feet. It's about two feet deep. It's got lots of great shelter and rocks and habitat around it. This one's a little smaller. This is more like five by three feet. It's only about a foot deep. Again, this is something you can squeeze into the corner of your yard. This is gonna have a liner under it to hold water. And again, those websites will go into great detail on how to do that. You can see the structure and the vegetation here. This is maybe the size of two trash can lids. You know, this is just a couple feet wide, maybe eight inches deep. It's gonna help all those wildlife that I talked about. It even has a little cooling den there for frogs or salamanders that just sort of clay pot laid on the side. So this is very small and manageable. This is really just the size of a large puddle. Again, imagine something like a, a warbler or a turtle being able to crawl in and out of it. That's the size that you want. Kevin, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but you've got about five minutes. Excellent, thanks. Yep, we're, we're almost ready for the projects. So this then just shows um, you can get really creative. You know, you can have something portable. You can take a pot, a container, and you can turn it into a little portable water feature, a portable wildlife pool. You can put plants in there. You can put rocks around it, get really creative. So some basic things for us to keep in mind in general when you're doing your backyard wildlife habitat. How do you know you're successful? You want diversity, you want biodiversity out there. You can use iNaturals to keep track of everything in your yard. Are there babies? Is there breeding and reproduction, reproduction happening in your yard? Are there predators? Predators are nature's stamp of approval. If a heron comes and eats some of your cute tree frogs, that's okay, they're supposed to do that. If birds come and eat some of the beautiful caterpillars, they're supposed to do that. You're trying to create sanctuary for the whole food web and things eat each other and that's okay. So just a real quick review. This is sort of what we've been talking about, about sort of backyard habitat, what's most important for climate change. These are some of the animals that need most of your help. Again, you're trying to provide shade and cool shelter, water and moisture. Anything you do is wonderful. These will especially help folks, um, species that are threatened by climate change. Okay, so we are going to jump into our do-it-yourself projects now. Um, so gather up supplies that you may have. If you don't have time to get together supplies, that's fine. You can just hang out and talk with Margot. We're just gonna do this for about 10 minutes. So you can hang out and talk with Margot and I. If you do have supplies, sort of gather them together. I'm gonna show you a couple of photos so you know what they look like. We're then gonna put the instructions up on the screen and they're gonna stay there. And then Margot Margo and I are gonna hang out and we can answer any of your questions. And all you're doing today is starting a project. Don't feel any pressure to finish it. You're just doing a quick start. So a few pictures before we start. These are what the hanging bird feeders can look like. You can use a hanger or wire to stick a bunch of grapefruit or orange halves onto it, put it on a tree branch, you're good to go. Or you can use string and pencils or other pieces of wood to make sort of a little hanging feeder, which you can also see. Instead of putting seed in it, maybe scoop out half of your orange and put in moisture rich foods like grapes and raisins and cranberries. So an animal can come and eat a little bit of the orange or a little bit of the berries. You can also do a suit cage. We're not making that today, but that's a really good high moisture food for birds or a simple suet cage you can buy in a store. We're also gonna be making native bee bundles. These are what the boxes look like. This is what you're gonna be making today if you choose. Very simple, you're gonna take your stems or tubes, you're gonna tie them in a bundle and you're gonna hang them in a tree. So simple. You can get fancy and put them in a can if you want. You can sort of put them in the shade, maybe underneath the, the roof of your shed or your house, but it's a bundle of tubes or hollow stems tied with string, hang it in a tree. And it's these little beautiful native mason bees. 
that will come and lay their eggs in it. The cooling dens, another project you can do if you want. You can see this is so simple. You take a dish, you take a pot, you turn it upside down, you put some rocks and soil next to it. A toad, a salamander, a lizard can hang out in there. You can get a little more involved, include a water pan, some more rocks, some logs. You can see the one at the bottom gets a little more formal. Any of these are cooling dens, a space for salamanders, toads to hide. And then of course, you can help me help tree frogs take over the world by making cooling dens out of PVC pipes. You can add that. And the last one is your wildlife drinking station. Pretty self-explanatory. You can take a trash can lid, a bucket lid, put it on top of some rocks or an old bucket, put a rock in there so animals can climb in and out so they don't get stuck in there. The rock weighs it down and allows them to wade in and out. Something as simple as a trash can lid on the ground with pebbles in it, and there's a bird. Remember, these animals have very short legs. You just want a couple inches of water in there. You can have a, a container in the ground with rocks. You fill that up once a week with water. The rocks help hold the moisture. Tomato cage, water drinking station, pretty self-explanatory. You can use the rocks to steady it, but you probably don't even need that. You can see on the left-hand side, they just put it on the top. You can make one of those. These are some funky ones that get really complicated that you could work on later when you have more time. They put a, um, a container of water up above it that drips a little bit, like one drip a minute, which turns it into a little like mini waterfall that birds love. And you've seen this already if you wanna sort of make it portable. So folks, that's it. So the 10 minutes starts now. Margo and I aren't going anywhere, we're right here. Use your supplies. Choose one of these you want to make. Ask us any questions you want. These are the instructions. It's really pretty simple. You can't make a mistake. <laughs> and you're just starting. Maybe all you do is sort of arrange your materials and get your thoughts together, and then you finish it up this weekend. That's fine. But we're going to spend the next 10 minutes just allowing you to play. And Kevin, there have been several questions in the chat. But if everyone is OK with that, why don't you Go ahead and play around with your activities and then we can uh, address the questions that you've had. They've been some great ones um, when you come back. I look forward to that. I have a question about the activity. Can oh, I use go. plastic yeah, straws for my bee bundle? Yes, you can. Um, they may not last quite as long. If you use plastic straws, they're probably going to last maybe one season, but that's fine. That's totally fine. Um, plastic straws are fine. And so I have this collection. Um, some of them are boba straws, you know, with like the tapioca. So they're a little bigger around. And then some Perfect. are like standard size. Is that a That's good actually better because there's probably a dozen different species of native bees in Northern California that will use these bee bundles. Some of them are tiny. Some of them are the size of carpenter bees. So if, if your bundle has little straws and then others that are the size of a garden hose and every, anything in between, that's great. Diversity attracts diversity. So Daniel, had a, Daniel Shapiro was asking, he has several questions. He says, can he ask them live? Um, I guess I'm kind of curious as to how many people are out there doing their projects and whether we should save these questions for later. Uh, when people can come back, assuming that you've had to go somewhere to work on your project. Um, so people I mean, just throw in the chat whether they're actually working on a project or if they'd like to uh, just take this time for Q&A. I would say anything related to the projects, definitely ask. But um, yeah, yeah, that's my point, I think, which most of the questions are more generalized questions. I mean, they are related, but not like yours, Carrie, that is a real um, you know, construction question. Yeah, feel, I mean, feel free to, to unmute yourself and just holler. Yeah, I think that's fine if you want to do that. Because we don't have a whole lot of time left, so. And I also will yeah. add that Margo and I are both going to hang around for at least 20 minutes after the end time, after three, to continue at asking questions. So don't worry if you not able to get your question to us. So I am using my husband's 
uh, computer, which is Daniel Shapiro, but I'm Carol. Um, and uh, I am a docent at Natural Bridges, of course, you know, one of the places for, where monarchs are not as much. Um, and we have a really active docent group where we meet and so, something like this. Is it possible to play the recording for the docent meeting? Because there are people there who would love to hear this and who would act on this. Because um, everybody's focused on, of course, the monarchs and then I'm focused on the birds at that, at Nova Bridges, et cetera. Is there a way that we can, you know, are we allowed to use the recording to, to show it at a docent meeting? Yes, you, you are. Uh, they, they will be posted, this, the recording will be posted on our CEI website. Uh, and I will send you that link. And you, it, we will probably get it up, let's say Tuesday, we can try to get it up by Friday. Carrie, do you think? Yeah, if there's a certain day you need it, just let me know and I can make yeah. sure to prioritize it. That's an amazing idea. And yeah, that's a great totally idea. we totally support you doing that. If you even want to tell us when it's going on, um, you know, we, we love to hear about other uses as long as Kevin's good with it, I'm sure. Oh, I'm totally fine with that. And, and honestly, also, um, you know, I, I want to call you Daniel, but that's your, your husband. What I know, I know. You can call me Daniel. That's fine. <laughs> okay. I would be also happy, you know, if this worked out to, to talk directly with the docents. If you want to, you know, reach out to me through Margo, I'd be happy to talk to them as well. That would be stunning. We have experts coming in all the time and different things and all these different topics. And yeah, we love it. Be happy to. Well, you should have my email in a couple of different places, I think, um, Carol. And, and I, will, I can stick it in here again. And I, I, I see Starhawk has raised her hand. Do you have a question for us? Yeah. Um, I have a house in San Francisco and we have a backyard where uh, we do have a lot of bird life and a lot of these things, but we also have a big problem in the city with rats. And I was wondering if you had any thoughts about uh, how to balance the rat mitigation with the wildlife attraction. Totally, that's a fantastic question. And that, that's a really good example of make sure that you do something that fits your site. So if you have rats, then I would say don't use seed or suet. I would focus on hanging feeders that have fruits. That's going to attract them less. The bee bundles will be great for them. Um, you might want to stay away from these cooling dens. You know, you might be hesitant to put out the piles of rocks and logs if you really have issues with rats. So focus on something else. Focus on a water feature. Focus on container gardens with um, native plants, like little pocket meadows in the container gardens. Um, so you just kind of use this as a menu and pick what works best for you. Rats are really gonna be attracted to seed and to suet and to dense structure on the ground to hide it. So you might wanna avoid those things and focus on the other things we've talked about. Focus on butterflies and bees and songbirds, hummingbirds. There's a related question, but I don't know whether Rob that Robin asked. I don't know if she's off doing her project or if she, so. I don't hesitate to ask it. Uh, I'm here. Um, here. Okay. Well, your your question was that you're worried with water features is you don't want to attract raccoons. Yep. So that's similar. So what do you does that? What's your thought about that one, Kevin? Sure. I'll mention a couple things. First, because I forgot to mention it, I will say something about mosquitoes. You can get something yeah. called BT rings. It's just the letters B and T. You can order it off of Amazon. You can get BT rings at any hardware store. They are a naturally occurring bacteria. It's not a pesticide. It's a naturally occurring bacteria in its dormant state. You put it in the water. Mosquito larvae um, are killed by it. It's just specific to fly larva. You can put BT rings in fish ponds, in places that have salamander and frog tadpoles, dragonfly larva. It's only gonna hurt mosquito larvae. So those are BT rings. As far as raccoons, yeah, that is a challenge for sure. If you put out a water feature, you probably will have a raccoon. Um, I would say if that's a real concern, then you could either have a hanging water feature have like a basket that has a water feature and that's just gonna be good for like birds and butterflies. 
probably won't have a raccoon climb up just for water. They would climb for seed. But so you could do that, or you could just skip that and do the other things we've talked about. You know, it's not going to be possible to do all of these things. Um, or you accept that you have raccoons. Yeah, there's lots of different ways to look at it. Make well, sure I already you know. have a lot of raccoons that walk through okay. our property. I just don't sure. want raccoons to set up residence because, you know, they have their um, little urine things that carry disease sure. and blah, blah, blah. So it just, you know, people need to be kind of aware of, you know, what some of the issues might be. Of course, that's a really good point. Yeah, if that's an issue in your neighborhood, then you could just not do the water feature and that's okay. You know, no one's gonna be able to do everything on this list. Choose what works for you and you can change. One year, try one thing, another year, try something else. So you might wanna focus on the bee bundles, container gardens for butterflies and songbirds. Um, yeah, you just sort of focus on what works for you. So I had another question about the frog tube thing. Yeah. How, so they seemed kind of tall. How do the frogs get in there? So that's a great question. Tree frogs have suction cups. They can hang on glass upside down. They're better than Spider-Man. So they have no trouble going in up there. They're not gonna get stuck. They have these amazing little suction cup pad feet. And those, those um, tubes wouldn't have to be tall. You could have one that was just a foot, that would be fine. I think the taller ones are probably because you'll get more frogs and maybe it makes them safer from certain predators. Hmm, interesting, but thank you. You could just do a foot and they, their suction cups, they can cling upside down. Let's wait maybe another- I, I trust that everyone else is working hard out there. It's good, great. good. Yeah. Yeah, let's wait maybe another two minutes or so. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm in no rush. But <laughs> Evan, from making a bee bundle here, it just has six straws. Right. <laughs> um, this is an old toilet paper tube I made smaller. Um, yours said it should be a little bit longer, um, but I read be... something else where you can make a little overhang um, if it's shorter. So what do you think a good length is? I would say, you know, anywhere from like six inches to a foot and a half okay. in length is fine. And an overhang is nice. That protects them from the rain, mm -hmm. gives them some shade. So, I mean, to answer your question, Carrie, really any of those would work as long as it's, I would say it needs to be a minimum of, of like five or six inches. Um, so then any, any size between that and 18 inches is fine. So I should stick two toilet paper rolls together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's going to last longer. It's going to be more protected. You know, any, that might mean it lasts for two seasons. And we're talking about climate change and high temperatures. So if you could put your bee bundle under the eave of a shed or in a tree with enough branches so that it gets some shade, then it won't get too hot. What kind of bees did you say these will attract? Mining bees, mason bees, leaf cutting bees, and carpenter bees. Mason bees are the main one. Mason bees are the thing that everybody tries to get and they're the easiest to get. But you might also get some mining bees, leaf cutting bees, or carpenter bees. But it's the mason bees that use clay. That's why they're called mason bees. They use clay and they build little cells inside your tubes and each cell has an individual baby. So each one of those tubes will be a nursery for half a dozen little mason bee larvae. Hmm. Does that mean you need to have water nearby for them to, for clay? It's now, of course, bees can fly great distances, but your bee bundle will be more successful if it is within sight of water. I'd say if it's within, you know, 20 or 30 feet of some little puddle or pool or stream or bird bath, something so they can get some water, you'll have more bees using it. Yes. Okay. Um, Daniel slash Carol again. Um, <laughs> I, and first of all, I would love to raise my hand, but I don't even know where I can do that. So That's okay. don't worry about that. <laughs> okay. Um, so my overarching thing, I, 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 um, I've taught uh, science and uh, environmental education for years. Like I said, I'm a docent at Natural Bridges. I started a Migratory Bird Day Festival at Natural Bridges that was destroyed by COVID. Oh well, but um, uh, 
I live in the Santa Cruz Mountains and have 10 acres in the mixed forest. Um, my goal is to this year, I'm really focused on, on habitat, 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 habitat. Um, and so all of these things, I'm, you know, some of them trying to put into effect already, et cetera. What I would really love is, um, I don't know if Nature Conservancy or anybody does where I can have somebody come out. Um, I can hire somebody to come out who is a specialist. You can look at my specific habitat and recommend, especially the kinds of plants, um, uh, just a variety of things that I can use that's really sort of tailor-made to, to our habitat here. Um, so I can then start working on implementing it. Is there any kind of a program or any place that you know of that I could, could find someone who I could have come out? Santa Cruz Mountains is one of my favorite places. So if you pay for my plane ticket, I'll come out and take a look at it. But, um, <laughs> so I, I'll make if a couple of suggestions. Let me know and I'll pay for getting closer. <laughs> okay. I'll make a couple of suggestions and Margo and Carrie might have additional ones. Um, I'm sure there's a local native plant society in the Santa Cruz there area. Is. And they would probably have a volunteer that would probably love to come out and look at your property. So I would start- I've been trying that. I've been trying that and so far not okay. successful. Okay. <laughs> Another thing, look for a National Audubon Society local chapter. So look up National Audubon Society, Santa Cruz or California Audubon Society, Santa Cruz. And they may have somebody that will come. Um, I, I, was I was wondering about Nature Conservancy also. The, one of the things that I have neighbors who are, I guess the thing that just is really horrifying me in California is as we're, of course, dealing with fire problems, um, big fire problems. I have friends and I used to teach in the area that had one of the huge fires in their big basin. Um, and what a lot of people are doing who you know, lived in the forest, they moved there to this forest, but now they're afraid of the fire, obviously. So what's happening is they're removing a lot of the trees yeah. um, and then they're absolutely just destroying the understory, which, yeah. you know, the soil moisture and everything and, you know, the habitat for birds, et cetera, it's just, it's horrifying to watch. Um, so I'm at least wanting our, <laughs> our area to be good. And I'm also wanting to be able to educate a lot of our neighbors, at least even on our quote block, which is acres and acres and acres and acres, where I'm seeing a lot of this happening. Um, so, so yeah. Um, I mean, that's, that's tough because of course fire <laughs> is scary, right? Fire is really scary and it's fire is really real. So I under, understand people wanting to make changes to their landscape for that. And then of course, as you've said, it can be very destructive. I get questions about that on Long Island, because Long Island is more of a fire landscape than you would think because of the pine barrens here. And when I go out and talk to people, I show them a website that I, I can send to um, Carrie and Margot. They probably have it already. That basically talks about defensible space. That you look at your house and you say, you know, you don't want any plants within like six feet of your house. And then you want vastly reduced plants within like 15 to 30. You have these zones, you have circular zones around your house and you can talk to people about using that as a way to make your landscape fire wise, but not completely denuded. And I, I can send you a link to that. Yeah, Fire Safe Marin, Fire Safe Sonoma. Um, we're even doing a project called Fire Up coming up in the spring. We'll have fire, um, Representatives from different uh, stakeholders, I, I would say, from the fire from fire in Sonoma County, um, coming together to talk about fire resiliency. And a lot of those people have different um, things that they can contribute. Some of them talking about home hardening, some talking about vegetation, some talking about climate change in general and how that's affecting fire. And so um, definitely stay in in contact with us as we bring those programs in. But um, yeah, there's a lot of good resources in our area too about that. And you know, grass gets a bad rap for a lot of reasons, but it doesn't burn. So that's just an example of there are woody plants, there are herbaceous plants, all sorts of things to take into account. And um, you know, I don't like saying don't plant things. 
<laughs> um, it's about fuel reduction and where it is and how it connects to your home and so complicated. I'm sure we could have like a whole series on it. Um, I would love to do that, Carrie, but we have come to the end of our program. And <laughs> I am really sorry that we, ha we have, but I'm hoping that all of you who are hanging in there and have questions still, there are a few more questions in the chat that I didn't want to answer. Didn't want to, that I haven't gotten a chance to answer or ask to Kevin. Uh, but I wanted to just to really do a quick little wrap up and then, and then Kevin and Carrie, maybe too, and I'll hang around, but well, thank you, Kevin. I uh, really, really appreciate the, you, the effort that you go in to make these and the clear picture that you've given us of the issues and some of the things we can steps we can take to make things better. Um, this is just one of our 18 events, as I mentioned, and they're free events, as you know. Uh, you can find a full listing at cei.sonoma.edu slash calendar, which I think is already in the chat. And our next program on November 30th is Mushrooming Basics. And um, in that program, you're going to learn the techniques of mushroom identification and how to use iNaturalist to help to, to uh, hone down that identification. And following that, it's going to be building resilience, disaster support for vulnerable populations, which showcases a broad coalition of organizations working together to address sustainability in Sonoma County. 